There's a saying that numbers don't lie, and that's certainly true. But numbers can certainly be misleading if they're not interpreted properly. The Shark Research Institute maintains a record of all reported shark attacks worldwide. This database is known as a Global Shark Attack File or GSAF. I downloaded the file from their website and isolated only the incidents from the year 2022. In all, I was able to isolate 82 separate incidents of unprovoked attacks. Now, remember what I said about how numbers can mislead? At the end of 2022, the world population was about 8 billion, so some people would say that your chances of getting bitten by a shark are 82 in 8 billion, which boils down to a 1 in 97 million 560,975 chance of being attacked by a shark. But remember what I said, numbers can be misleading. About 40% of the world's population lives 70 miles or less from the coast. Many persons who live far from the coast never leave the interior to visit the coast. And some people who live on the coast never learn to swim or venture into the ocean. From my personal experience, whenever we go to the beach, about three quarters of the group goes into the water. So 40% of 8 billion is 3 billion 200 million. Now, I don't have any exact figures for the coastal dwellers who actually go to the beach. But if we take into account that some people from the interior will take vacations to the beach, then we could work with this conservative number of 3 billion 200 million. So now, your chances of being attacked by a shark are 1 in 39 million 24,390. But again, remember what I said about misleading numbers. This probability would only hold true if you exhibited the same behavior under the same situations as those 82 victims. The point I'm trying to make here is that, in scientific studies, numbers mean nothing unless all factors are taken into consideration, which is what we're going to do now. In 2022, 87% of the victims suffered some type of injury, and in 10% of those cases, the injuries were fatal. 74% of those attacks occurred outside the safe zone. In part one of this documentary, we define what a safe zone is. 35% of the victims were alone in the water, but when we focus on fatalities only, that number jumps to 77%. 29% of the attacks occurred when there was low lighting, meaning that the sun was low in the sky or it was overcast. And more than half of the attacks occurred in waters with low or no visibility. 20% of the attacks occurred near ocean drop-offs. These are locations where the water's depth changes suddenly from relatively shallow water to deep water. 14% occurred where they were schooling fish. However, this number could be much higher as it is not always possible to confirm this, especially if the water is murky or if there are low light conditions. And in 24% of the cases, Warnings were given either verbally or by posted signs, and those warnings were ignored. This number could possibly be higher also, as we do not have all the details regarding some attacks. 21% of the victims were surfing, and another 30% were doing some type of swimming or snorkeling. Of all the 82 victims, 62% were local to the beach in question or visited there regularly. Tiger sharks were confirmed responsible for 11% of the attacks, but this number could be higher, as some sharks were not identified in the attacks, and oftentimes tiger sharks are mistaken for bull sharks. The Great White was responsible for 10% of all the attacks, but this number could also be higher, and the bull shark was responsible for 8% of attacks, although this number could also be higher. If we look at fatalities, we see the Great White and Tiger lead the stats with three victims each, and in three other cases, the perpetrator was not identified. However, this stat only tells part of the story, but we'll talk about that later. Right now, we're going to travel to Jamaica. Parish of Clarendon, here in Lionel Town, this is where the person who we'll be talking to was born. His name is Michael Simpson, and on June 24, 2022, he lost his right arm to a tiger shark. As Michael would go on to explain, 
He actually lives in Mitchelltown, but he sailed from Salt River with nine other fishermen on the day in question. Hello? Morning, sir. How are you doing? Good morning, sir. I'm doing good. Ah, glad to hear. Glad to hear. Uh, first of all, I want to yeah. thank you very much for doing this interview uh, with regards to the tragic incident that happened last year. Yes, sir. So, just to dive straight in, no pun intended, where exactly did you start the fishing trip from? Um, still from Clarendon, there's a beach named Saltiva. So that, is that near to Lionel Town? Yes, that's where we come from. Big Half Moon Key is less than 10 miles from Salt River, and Michael said that they took two hours to get there. So, either they were traveling about five miles per hour, or they made stops to spearfish at different locations along the route. The fishermen could not find any fish, and Michael did not feel comfortable in the water as it looked green and scary. So he decided to head back into the boat, but the current was carrying him in a different direction. So after using his right hand to make a turn to head for the boat, he felt something grab onto his arm. So can you give us a rundown of how the, the, the shark attack happened? Because the news report says that you fell into the water. No, we went to see. Um, seven other guys them jump off before me jump off and Okay. So for a couple of seconds, a couple of seconds I me I say Then I'm on a love ramp I me mean, I think I want my friend grab on for me. I ramp with me. Okay. I mean, me I say no sir. So that's something I lick up in my heart. I can a person will on for me and me look from my right and me see side the shark. Okay. Because she went and grabbed me stuff. So I have the spear gun in my left hand. So I kind of, so I start joking with it and joking, joking till he swam off with me. The goggles gone, the spear gun gone. Wow. So only thing I find, I find myself on him back. Then one man come to me and say, peel finger and push the finger in and gill. When I push the finger in and gill, he start come up and I go down. Because it seems like he's taking water so he can't stay there long, long with me. Uh -huh. So the guy in the boat now see what's going on and drive the boat come in there. Come up there. So when the boat reached near, I let him go. So I pull out from the arm and I tell the guy to jam up in the boat. And I say, jam me up because the shot bite off my hand. And in the boat, I tell him to get a piece of rope and tie me hand. Then to pick up the rest of the guys then. After picking up the other men, they sailed to the Jamaica port, by which time a car was called to pick him up and take him to a hospital. According to Michael, the depth of the water where the attack occurred was approximately 25 to 30 feet deep. So, would you say that you were emotionally affected by the attack and you're still having like dreams or nightmares, no? No, you know, only thing kind of bother me, um... Sometimes the hand numb up like it, it's there. But the doctor did tell me that um, you go to feel, have that feeling, see how I tell the brain to find out say it's not there, uh -huh. stop sending signal to it. Okay. Michael, my namesake, you're Simpson just like me. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for the time that you spent giving us this interview. Yeah. And we will definitely be in touch. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Greetings to the family. Okay, same to you, sir. Okay, bye. Michael says he believes he doesn't have nightmares because he tells himself that he was there for a reason. He believes that had it not been him, then one of the younger guys would probably have been attacked by the shark, and that guy would probably have not have survived as he was able to. Michael has been fishing on and off for 15 years and he also burned coal for a living. But in recent times, burning coal was not working out for him, so he started dedicating more time to the sea to earn a living. Michael confirms that the shark in question was indeed a tiger shark that measured about 15 feet, and that there has been a number of incidents involving tiger shark, but most of those incidents have not been reported in the media, because they weren't as serious as his. He was quick to point out, though, that the incidents involving tiger sharks are restricted to Jamaica's south coast, from St. Thomas in the east all the way to St. Elizabeth in the southwest. 
Losing his right arm has had a devastating effect on Michael's financial situation, as he's now struggling to take care of his two children who are now living with his mother. Any help that comes his way would be greatly appreciated. In the description to this video, you can find the original article that shows how to contact him directly. Michael attributes the issues with the tiger sharks on Jamaica's south coast to low fish stocks. He informed me that when they traveled to the Pedro Banks, an ocean rise about 40 miles southwest of Jamaica, the sharks completely ignore the fishermen. Michael, with his vast fishing experience, believes that the reason for this is a large amount of fishes that can be found in the Pedro Banks, which stretches for about 110 miles east to west and covers an area of about 3,104 square miles. With an abundance of food in the Pedro Banks, the tiger sharks there have absolutely no need to go after the men who fish there. But there is still more to analyze and discuss, so we'll continue this conversation in part 3. Please subscribe so you'll be notified as soon as part 3 is available. Mm -hmm.